Like I said, I do have handouts. I apologize. We'll get them to you um, tonight. Um, get them in your mailbox. They're just kind of a quick um, down and dirty on ventilation and oxygenation. The little pocket guides I handed out, if you don't already have them, just remember that they do not take the place of the manual. Uh, make sure you look at operator's manuals, just kind of quick reference. On the back of these pocket guides, what's really nice is a 1-800 number. Um, you are never alone. If you have any questions, call this number. They have 24-7 technical, su technical support and clinical support. Okay, if it's clinical support, they're going to tell you, if you're on a patient, call this number right now. They're all respiratory therapists in the clinical support and will answer any questions for you, okay? Technical support, anytime you need to set up, need to troubleshoot, they will help you. You can call me, you can call, there's lots of people to call. I don't always answer my phone if I'm teaching, but um, if it's a staff question, call technical support. Don't forget that number, okay? I'm gonna give uh, you however many of these you have, little magnets, and you can put them on the side of the outside and that number is right there, so don't forget it, okay? So again, I kinda harp on this, this is a two hour lecture. I'm going to try to speak quickly so I can really make some good bullet points, you know. Um, we've already lost a, a few minutes, but if you can stay, I would greatly appreciate it, okay, so we can get you through this. So what is high-frequency ventilation? Uh, <coughs> FDA defines it anything greater than 150 breaths per minute. Or per minute. Um, tidal volumes are equal to or less than anatomical dead space. All stem from a doc a hundred years ago, back in 1915, watching his dogs pant on his back step, trying to figure out how these dogs could ventilate. And he did hypothesize and then prove that, yes, indeed, you can ventilate at less than dead space ventilation. Very fast rates. Rates are expressed in a hertz. One hertz is 60 cycles. Therefore, whatever I multiply this times 60, 6 times 60 is um, 360 breaths. I'm not good at math, so don't judge, okay? It's very active exhalation. It's a push-pull system. In other words, it pulls gas out of the lung, unlike regular mechanical ventilation, that's passive exhalation, okay? Um, cleared in 2001 um, for all uh, um, pediatric adult patients, the big thing that FDA mandated is you have to be at least 35 kilos to be on the beat. You were telling me how you guys have a peds, and that's where that crossover is really there. Um, so you have to look at weight. Um, now, if you're maxed out on the A on a kid that's less than 35 kilos, and you've done everything in your power, and it's just not doing it, as long as that's documented, you can try the B, but you don't, you're not going to start a patient less than 35 kilos on the B, okay? So that weight is a big deal, okay? Indications, unlike the A that we're going to talk about tonight, acute lung injury, ARDS, early. That's about it, okay? So as we go through this, I'm going to just really briefly talk about the Oscillate Oscar study, okay? In a nutshell, we all learn things from a study. And what this study showed is maybe very early, early, early isn't the indication. But a lot of these hospitals that participated in the study, and I'm telling you this because I want you to share it with your docs who say, no, I'm not going to use the oscillator because of that study. Okay? A lot of those um, hospitals, I want to say over 50% of the hospitals that enrolled in that study did not have any oscillator experience. <coughs> so they didn't have those critical thinking skills, didn't know the ventilator, it was really novology for them. Okay? The other thing is when we don't use this as a rescue, we use it as a lung protective strategy device. If you get in earlier than later, how many times do you go on the oscillator and start at a pressure, a mean area pressure of 30? That's a lot of pressure on a semi-healthy lung, and that's what this study did. They started everybody at 30, and they're paralyzing them, so their hemodynamics kind of go 30 centimeters of water pressure on a healthy lung. So what was the mean on conventional ventilator on these patients? Probably five less. Usually they do five less, yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what the inclusion criteria was. I'd have to go back and look. Um, actually, I, sh I can't say that because that's um, not... Right, I can't say that. It was um, other inclusion criteria. I'd have to pull the article out. But the point made is these, these semi-healthy lungs didn't need to start at 30 centimeters of water pressure. So I think what we did learn from the study is that maybe early, early, and lower pressures would have had a different outcome. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about that because I wanna spend 
um, more time on this. Christina, are you referring to the study in Great Britain that was done and says... The and one here, the Oscillate and Oscar study and, that Ferguson and, just came out with. Yeah, with yeah. pressure control. And Dr. Neil Mac yeah. McIntyre, if you know him yes. from Duke, mm -hmm. um, he has already written a rebuttal letter to the New England Journal of Medicine. And yeah, it's that's not that. changing mm -hmm. any use he has mm -hmm. uh, or his um, practices of, of using the beat. And you're right, and mentioned that it's, most of those physicians were not had experience with oscillator. That's the reason the conclusion was that oscillator and there's no difference between the oscillator and pressure control ventilation. Mm -hmm. That was the conclusion. But that was a very limited because the physician did not have that much experience how to manage those patients. Nor did this, a lot of the therapists. therapists. So okay. that's all I'm going to kind of say. So okay. why, you can see typically why we would use the oscillator. Do you guys use APRV here? Yes. Good, good. And that's a good stepping stone too as long as you use APRV. Uh, correctly too. So direct causes of acute lung injury, ARDS, you need to be thinking lung injury when you have patients here, trauma center, right? Level one trauma center, you get all these kind of things coming in. So this is what you want to start thinking about. Okay, I may start thinking lung injury, oscillator, things like that, because we know that flail chest, things like that are going to end up like this. Okay? So I'm not really going to get into ventilator induced lung injury. You guys know all this. Um, but I do want to talk about pressure and volume swings. You guys look at waveforms. Okay, if you want to move over so you can see. Um, we all know that we have a very small safe area that we can safely ventilate our patients. Okay, anything above that or below that is going to cause lung injury. Conventional ventilation, what happens is we all know ventilators take the path of least resistance. So we put them on a ventilator and I have a left lung problem. Where's that ventilator gas going to go? It's going to go to the right lung, right? So it's going to overflate the healthy alveoli and never get to that atelectatic. So we're kind of going through this vicious circle. And doing this, we all know cycling of the lung causes steering of the lung tissue, and that's what gets us in trouble. And somewhere in between here, we get a mean airway pressure, okay? So I want to show you this video. This is, a, this is pressure control ventilation, pressure control of 34 and a mean of 25. Look at the alveoli, see how they collapse when they exhale? And they're collapsing because they're de-recruited, okay? Pressure on the outside of the lung is greater than the inside of the lung. Some of those alveoli are so over-ventilated because they're healthy and they don't need ventilation. So pressure control isn't working, let's talk about APRV or bi-level. Even in APRV, um, we work more in the lower end of this um, pressure volume wave curve, okay? And what happens is during that, that brief release time in the beginning, we're still going to have alveoli collapsing, right? Because they're not recruited. It takes a good 8 to 10 hours to have them recruit. So looking at APRV with a very short collapse time of 0.2 seconds, you can see that you still have some collapsing alveoli that are de-recruited. Not to say it's not a bad start, though. So then we go to... Um, Oh, this is uh, APRV. You can see that there's no reason you guys can't do lung recruitment maneuvers on APRV. Set your ventilator, I don't think you guys use the AVIA, but set your ventilator where your time highs and your, wherever you want to recruit that lung, there's no reason that you can't do a lung recruitment maneuver on APRV. Just something to think about before you go on. When you use the B, do you guys do lung recruitment maneuvers? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll talk about when. Do you use it on every patient? Not every. No. How about cuff leaks? Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay, so we'll talk about that too. All right. So during high frequency, the whole um, cycle operates in that nice safe zone. Make no mistake, underventilating a lung will cause lung injury. Okay. It's not the atelectasis that causes the lung injury. It's how we treat that atelectasis that gets us in trouble. Okay. So again, same mean airway pressure of 25 like we were on conventional, <laughs> and look how nice, much more uniform ventilatory pattern. We don't see any over distension, under distension. Okay? So, again, just a cartoon to show you constant mean airway pressure. That's the piston going back and forth. Pressure waveform, you can see anything above or below that mean airway pressure is going to cause lung injury. We want to break that pulmonary sequence, keep that lung open. Okay? And lung protection by providing small alveolar swings, alveolar uh, peak airway pressures. Okay? Again, open up that lung and keep it open. That's our goal. Oh, there we go. 
It's a super CPAP system, right? If, if I had a patient breathing, I have flow, I have pressure, and CPAP, right? We kind of call it CPAP with a wiggle. We call APRB CPAP um, with a release, right? It's really all it is, okay? So what happens is we turn our flow on, whatever the flow is. It comes out here behind um, the flow meter, down into pick up humidity, back up through up through the circuit. I have inspiratory side and I have an expiratory side. You guys know that you can feel flow back here. Don't play with it. Make the little noises. Okay, a lot of people like to make tunes with it, um, but you're going to pop that that cap diaphragm. But do you know what that is? The, this air that you feel here? It's just the unused bias flow. It's escaping. That's all it is. So you should feel air there. You might feel air around here too. All right. So we know the water escapes down there. We also know the water goes through here and down here. One question. Some of the therapists, they usually put a piece of cloth or a diaper or Stole something to cover that. Yep. Do is not, that okay? Do not cover this. Don't put a cup over it. Don't put a washcloth over it. Put nothing over it. If you're really worried about that sticking out there, um, stand on this side or there's a piece of our equipment that you can buy. It's a little baffle. Um, Brandon can get it for you and it'll baffle that flow down. Okay? There's more nurses that do that. I think nurses do that. I think uh, they mentioned it that two or three therapists have this habit when they put them on. They usually cover them Don't with Don't do cloth. that. If that ends up getting occluded, what yeah. do you think is going to happen? Yeah, not a good thing. Do you guys use the filter circuits at all? Uh, we have a couple of them for H1 and 1, but the only thing we have because we have to change the filter every 12 hours. 24. 24 hours and have to connect and disconnect. Disconnect. Is that better that outweigh the risk? Yeah. Correct. Still use PPE precautions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take off my care fusion hat a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, did okay. you stop it? Okay. Yeah. Um, I personally don't like that filtered circuit. I think it's great, but again, does that benefit outweigh the risk of disconnecting? That's why a lot of people don't. You know, what did we do before filtered circuits? So that's all I'm saying. You want us to all have the N95 on, correct? Yeah. Yeah. When they go on the patient with yeah, TV, yeah, we talked ARDS. About that. Okay. Was it you that emailed me yes. those questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the more flow I have going through here, the more distended that little mushroom valve gets, the more resistance it creates, the more mean air pressure I get. Okay. You guys are all experienced users, right? Okay. I promise you, we will you learn one new thing today. All right. Um, so we know oxygenation and ventilation, very unique to this ventilator, are totally decoupled from each other. Again, the only ventilator you'll work with if that, that's true. Um, oxygenation is controlled by my mean airway pressure and my FiO2. Nothing else controls oxygenation. Well, almost nothing. We'll talk about that a little bit. Ventilation is by my uh, delta P, inspiratory time percent, and frequency. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm not really going to get into the mechanisms of this, but um, you want to learn how this ventilator works, Google Dr. Chang, and he has a 13-page article that will tell you all about how this ventilator works. But I do want to talk about the pendulift effect, and we'll talk about that when I recruit this lung. You'll see that pendulift effect. Again, what's going to happen? Gas will take the path of least resistance. It's going to find those healthy alveoli. They're going to dump into the less healthy alveoli, less compliant, and cause this homogenous gas mix. And we want turbulent flow, unlike the uh, conventional ventilation, where we want laminar flow. So lots of reasons why this oscillator works compared to conventional ventilation that only uses convective ventilation and molecular diffusion. Okay. So mean airway pressure will go all the way up to 55%. Oscillatory pressure greater than 140. You may max out at 90 because of your compliance, but that's just the specs of the ventilator. Frequency 3 to 15, and you can monitor. You guys know that your blender is teed in, compressed air hose. You have two compressed air hoses. Back in the day before we had blenders, you used to have to plug in two <coughs> compressed air hoses because of the fan, okay? We'll talk about alarms um, in a minute. You guys are already ahead of the game. You know to analyze your FiO2 there. That flow meter only needs to go on one to two liters is all you need. It's the same FiO2 there as it is here, as it is here. And the reason why is if you put your analyzer in line and that fuel cell goes bad, what do you have to do? Disconnect. First takeaway message is we never, never, never disconnect. And then I kind of have to retract that statement and say the only time we disconnect is to troubleshoot the ventilator. 
okay? So let's talk about alarms, all right? I'm really going to go over alarms. I was um, informed about the, an incident you had a couple of days ago, and I really want to go over alarms, okay? Um, there's four alarms here. They all sound the same. So when the alarm goes off, you guys need to look to see what's alarming, okay? The first alarm is greater than 60 centimeters of water pressure, okay? What do you think would cause that alarm? If I can get it to jump here, hang on. It's the floor we just mentioned. A position coming in here. Okay, so that's what you get, right? So, Nuvo, obstruction, what it does is it's dumping to this dump valve. So, patient, if he were waking up, he's kind of breathing ambient air, but he's also going to get a pneumo, right? So, this is a not enough flow to sustain spontaneous breathing. That's exactly why we knock these patients out and we paralyze them, okay? So, you need to figure out what's going on with the patient in order to fix that, okay? So, again, do I have a pneumo? Do I have an obstruction? Am I kinked? Am I awake? Things like that, okay? These little lines are there for a reason. Do you ever know those little lines? Okay, they tell you what to do, okay? A lot of times, if this really maxes out, sometimes it will stop the piston, okay? Piston needs five to seven centimeters of water pressure to keep working. So if that piston stops, the light's still on, but it doesn't have any pressure. So it's just telling me I have to reset. You guys know hitting that button doesn't do anything. You have to hold it. So I always say take a cleansing breath. Hold it, 1-1000, one, 2-1000. One thousand, one thousand. And that's what I tell nursing if they disconnect and they have to start it up. Because again, you know this ventilator doesn't restart by itself. Do, do nurses touch your vents at all? Just the FIO2. Just the FIO2. Okay. Okay. So the next alarm is mean airway pressure less than five centimeters of water pressure. What will cause that? A leak. A leak, a disconnect, okay? All right, so piston stop. Again, all it's telling me is you gotta fix the problem and reset it, okay? See how it doesn't start? One, 1,000, two, 1,000. Once that reaches five to seven centimeters of water pressure, piston's already on, I don't need to be touching the piston, okay? These two alarms are going to be my thumb wheels, whatever my mean airway pressure. Usually they're set five above, five below. Some people go 10, depending. If I had air leak, I'd probably set them at five. If I have ARDS, I may go 10. Where do you guys set these? Yeah. 10? Okay. So if I'm on a mean airway pressure of 20, I'm going to set this at 30 and this at 10. Okay? What would make these two alarms go off? You'll notice that it doesn't bring me back to my reset button. Um, because a lot of times when these go off, it, it won't stop my piston, okay? So what would make these alarms go off? Come on, guys. Yeah, intermittent leak, patient waking up and breathing, lots of water in the tubing. Remember, we don't want our tubing like this. Okay, things like that are going to make them go off. Big, big aha moment. This is your limit, okay? So, if I have a patient on a mean airway pressure of 40, let's say mean airway pressure of 20, and I don't have this set appropriately, and I have this set at 30 or 40, let's say 40, I will get a pressure in those lungs all the way up to 40. Very, very different than the A. You guys have all used the A? Okay, your limit is here, that blue knob. In the B, your limit is here. It's very, very important that you set that, because remember, when we set this up, it's set at 59. You don't fix that first breath on that patient that he wakes up, I can give that patient 60 centimeters of water pressure. Very, very important concept. You guys all know that? Know that that's your limit. It's a big aha moment, okay? So, lots of reasons why these go off. <coughs> Obviously, look to see which one it is, okay? You guys know, source gas low, less than 50 PSI. Battery low, it has a little nine volt battery in the back, it does not run the ventilator. Okay, all it does is run, and I say it, because it's been asked, it's not. It's just for your LED and your visual and audio. Um, 
battery low, you can take that battery out on the patient. Doesn't go black, there's a fuse inside, and change that battery. In all my years, I've never had to change that battery. Use your PM every six months, and the batteries change there. Do you know how to, how do you know your battery works? I don't even know what that is. Yeah. It's right here in the back. The back. Um, I've never seen it. So if your alarm isn't very loud, does that mean the battery is kind of low? Could be, but not, not very often because sometimes um, if they're um, they maintenance. Alarm loudness? No, no. no. Okay. So right here, I oh, yeah. you guys put your clamp there. So I guess you have to take this off too. But right behind that, um, there are two little screws, and you just have to unscrew the top one, and it falls down. It's a little nine volt battery. Okay. You guys are testing that battery all the time. And again, you know how we just kind of go through the motions. But watch what happens when I hit my reset. See that light go on? Your battery's good. Okay, okay. y'all just learned something, huh? Told you you would. Um, oscillator overheated, very important to have that uh, compressed air teed in. This gets to 150 degrees, this light goes on, it gets to 170, this ventilator will shut down. Not a whole lot you can do about it. So, as a respiratory therapist, it's not something we think about the temperature in the room. So when you got a patient in the room, and who is it? So it's that 450 pound guy on a road to bed, on dialysis, 20 IVs, right? Because do you intervene as a lung protective strategy device or do you intervene as a rescue? Honestly. Rescue. So you're going to give me maxed out on your settings, and if it's very warm in that room, call engineering. Tell them to cool that room down. Get that temperature down before you even start. Okay? And that will help you guys. Okay? Other things that can cause alarms, I guess you guys, again, are ahead of the game. To me, these are a piece of um, emergency equipment. They're just like your bag mask. Okay, so it's nice to see that you guys have them taped to the side of the ventilator. One of these blows where you have to go and get your equipment out the room down the hall. So it's nice that you have that. Um, good news, um, I, I heard in March, but I don't know for sure, that um, they're remaking these and they're going to be all one piece. So they won't, yeah, pretty cool, huh? But right now, when you guys do your vent check, do you check your Lurlocks, your Lurlocks? No. I would encourage you to. Because if they are spinning, it means that this little piece has popped out. So it's sitting there, but I can spin this. Okay? So you're going to see your mean airway pressure dip a little bit. Okay? And so very loosely, guys, don't crank it. Just kind of check to make sure that they don't spin. If they do, unfortunately, the only thing you can do is take the patient off, have the nurse back, and you can either take the time to put tab A into slot B, or just throw it on the floor and get a new mushroom bell, okay, and always use your fork to check it. The last thing that can happen is these can get a little pinhole in it. When you get a pinhole in it, you're not going to know which one of these three has got the pinhole. I'm certainly not going to take the time to inspect it. I'm going to throw them on the floor and get the next three up. So always have these standby. Okay? Questions on alarms? You said that the ventilator wouldn't start until the main airway at 5 and 7. The piston won't start. I thought it wouldn't start until it hit 20 and 7. It's the A, and that's a low alarm. And we'll talk about that. It has to do with your alarm. You're right, but different, different concept. Okay? This is only less than 5%. It's, it's, it's a different setup because my limit is here and the A, the limit's over here. Okay, but you're right on that. It just has to do with your 20%. Okay? Questions on alarms? You got it? Good. This just shows you ways you can hook up your FiO2. You guys are already ahead of that game, so I'm not going to go there. Um, ventilation, again, the B is a larger piston. Um, better cooling system, so you don't see them overheat as much. But if you're toss-up, let's say all your Bs are in use and you have an 18-year-old that really needs a B and you decide to put them on an A and you need um, uh, more ventilation, 
It looks the same, doesn't it? Okay, this power, make no mistake, a power of 4 on the B is twice the power of 4 on the A. They're not the same. They're the same number, but they're not the same power. Okay, so you're kind of doing the patient a disservice. Okay? You're better off renting a B. Much longer circuit. Do not interchange these circuits. You guys know that, right? You can't put an A circuit on here or a B circuit there. Okay, you guys already know how the mushroom valve works. Um, what we're talking about is mean airway pressure depends on bias flow. If I don't have enough bias flow, I don't have a mean airway pressure. If I am maxed out on my mean airway pressure here, I don't have enough bias flow for this patient. See what's happening? So what I need really, I will, ideally, I want this knob somewhere between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. If I start maxing out, I need more flow. Okay? Question, Christina. <clears throat> when the physician orders the mean airway pressure, the best way to set that mean airway pressure is the mean airway pressure knob or just increasing your bias flow to get that mean airway pressure. Mean airway pressure knob. Okay. Mean airway pressure yes. knob. Do not use your flow to adjust your mean airway pressure. Okay? Because I have seen Put that. enough flow to where your mean airway pressure gives you room. If you know you're starting on a mean airway pressure of 20, most adults I'm going to start a flow of 30. Okay? If 30 of flow doesn't give me a mean airway pressure of 20, then I don't have enough flow because I got no room to work. I want to be able to adjust this flow to where my mean airway pressure is somewhere between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. The only time I want it down here closer to minimum is when I get ready to lean and, and go back to conventional. Okay? If I'm really starting to max out, you need to increase your flow, but make sure when you increase your flow, your hand is still on this knob because if I increase my flow, what am I increasing? Mean airway pressure. I don't want to give them a pneumo. So I'm going to kind of do this double thing here, increase the flow and, and drop my knee. And you're saying the primary knob to set up your mean airway pressure is it's the mean, mean airway, airway pressure? pressure knob. Not flow. Okay? So the piston, um, I'm sorry, the power is just a potentiometer for the for the ventilator. It sends the electrical current to the coil, copper coil down here. So it's the stroke line of the ventilator, okay? You guys know that there's a lock here. Please use it. You start turning this with the lock down, eventually your power is going to spin and spin and spin. This power is just numbers, 1 through 10. They don't mean anything. There's no reference points. They're just numbers, okay? So if I unlock it and increase my power, I increase my delta P. Decrease my power, I decrease my delta P. The delta P is the distance that piston moves across that member, or across that mean airway pressure. So the greater the distance, the greater this peak to trough here, see peak trough, peak trough, the difference between the peak and the trough is your delta P. That's where that delta P comes from. Okay? So let's recruit this lung. If you can't see, please stand up. I'm going to show you that pendulift effect that, um, and this is my brand new lung, so it's going to recruit very quickly, um, and it's very big, <laughs> unlike my other ones. <laughs> Um, but you're going to see areas that are going, to, are going to recruit a lot quicker than other areas, okay? And i got to use big numbers here because it's a big long. Okay, here we go. So you can see, this is already recruited much quicker than this. This is recruited quicker than this. That's that pendulift effect, okay? So, we keep going and going, and believe me, this lung gets pretty big. Okay, this area still isn't recruited yet. Okay, and that's all that pendulift effect. Okay, because it's finding those compliant alveoli dumping into the less compliant. Okay, now, is this lung pretty recruited? Don't you wish you could see this on your patient? You can. Okay, outside of carbon monoxide poisoning, or cardiac anomalies, if you don't have a saturation of at least 88, you don't have a recruited lung. It's as simple as that, okay? So I know my lungs recruited when I have a saturation, okay? We'll talk more about this in a little bit, okay? So now that the lungs recruited, this down 
down a little bit. So the higher the power, the higher the delta P, the greater the distance that piston moves, the more chest wiggle I have, the more volume displaced, the more CO2 I want. Okay? In adults, we want clavicle to mid thigh. In peds, we want to the groin. Okay? Now, let's talk about that 400 pound patient. All right? Not easy to assess chest wiggle, is it? We want to stand at the foot of the bed. Hopefully, the head of the bed is 80 degrees, although I have started patients prone. But if you can have the patient sitting up at 80 degrees, get at the foot of the bed. If you can't see chest wiggle, put gloves on his thighs or insanely bullets, pencils, whatever you can see visibly to move so that you can see those thighs move. And I'm Liposuction just, also. Liposuction? Yeah. You just regard Okay, okay. That's, that's it. What? <laughs> okay. So put something visibly there. I always put gloves down because I can't see and I'm going to get at the foot of the bed and I'm going to look chest wiggle clavicle to umbilicus. Okay? When we use our mean airway pressure, we'll talk about this in a little while, but we usually move our in mean airway pressure in increments of two to five centimeters at a time. Ventilation, um, CO2 is a lot more forgiving. It diffuses 20 times faster than oxygen, so we can move it more. So my delta P, I'm going to move five to 10 centimeters at a time. I don't care where this power is, but I need to know where it is. Do you guys chart power? Good. Yeah. Do you know why you chart the power? Okay, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, if I don't have enough chest wiggle, I know I can go all the way up to 86, okay? In adults, we start at a power of 4.0 because it's a safe place to start. Again, I don't know what kind of delta P it's gonna give me yet, all right? So, I wanna document the power because a change in chest wiggle is a change in compliance. A change in delta P is a change in compliance. So, let me pick on somebody, I'll pick on you. You go into the pit, you've used it before, right? Yeah. And it's, it, we're just learning here. So you come in, and I just want to know what your practice is now. You come in, and we've charted a power of 4.3, and I have a delta P of 75. You come in an hour later, and that's reading 80. Other way around. Other way around. Other way around. Okay. But what do you do normally when you walked in? Talk me through what you would do when you see that at 80. I would adjust the power button to go back to what it was before. Eight. Okay. Exactly. Okay. This is going to be your aha moment. Okay. And I bet the docs think that too. So you guys need to be the messenger. Okay. This is a measurement, it is not a setting. This went up to 80, so the first thing I'm gonna do is look at my power, because can't I turn my power up to make it read 80? Right, I can turn it and make it read 80. So the first thing I'm gonna do is say, my power's still at 4.3, so I know nobody turned that up to get it to 80. So how did it get to 80? Patient's compliance got worse. So when you turn it, and people do this all the time, when you turn it back down to 76, because that's what the doctor ordered, right? You have just ignored what patient told you. Patient told you, I'm getting sicker, and it's taking more pressure to ventilate me, because this LED, I know, the equipment that has been This LED readout is reflective of my circuit not my patient's lungs, because this ET2 attenuates that pressure, okay? When you get to an ET2 of about 6.5 and above, this pressure is attenuated about 20%, okay? So you can see the waveform at the, at the proximal end of the ET2. Look how dampened it is when it gets to the crina. It's even more dampened when it gets down to that alveolar region, okay? That's why high frequency is so safe. So, when you walk in and see that this reads 80, but the doc wanted it 75, and you're turning it back down to 75, you just ignored what the patient told you. He told you, I need more pressure. I'm getting sicker. Or, I need suctioning, okay? What else can make this change? It is a measurement. Do you chart patient position when you chart? I would encourage you to, because I have a left side atelectasis, or the left side 
you know, ARDS is mainly on my left side for right now, okay? So I chart that this is 75 and I'm supine. Okay, now I walk in, the patient's on his left side, and that's my worst side. What do you think's gonna happen to that number? It's gonna go up, right? So I may not do anything. I may just kind of watch it. What if I come in and I find him on his right side, which is his good side, and now that's reading 70? Why would I want to turn it back up, okay? So if you chart your power, you come back tomorrow morning and you say, wow, I'm still on 4.3 and that's reading 70. What does that tell you? The patient's getting better. So why would I turn that up to 75 because the doctor ordered it? So you've got to get this message out that this is a measurement. Do not chase this number. What we really would like the doctors to do is say, delta P is 75, notify me of a 10 centimeter change, or eight, whatever he wants. Because I've seen this number go up in 20 minutes. It's gone from 75 to 82. Most of the time, patient can suction, okay? Suction it, and it goes right back down again. If I come in the next day and I see that number's reading 70 and nobody's changed my power, do I need to wean them? Maybe not, it depends on my CO2. If my CO2's 40, yeah, I'm gonna help wean it, but my CO2 is still 60 or 70, I'm gonna leave it alone, it's weaning itself. So I may or may not need to help it. Is this a big aha moment for everybody? I told you I didn't learn something. I don't know if the doctors are doing the right for them. They probably don't write for a power, but there are places out there that are switching over to power. So, and they don't care what this power is. They're looking at this number. But we've got to get that message out there that this number is not an ordered parameter. So they're going to write delta P of 75, but they got to give you some leeway. Right now, they probably give you CO2 parameters. Okay? But they don't know, excuse me, they don't know what's happening with the patient because they never see this number move. Why don't they see it move? because you guys are chasing it all day long. It's a I, big aha moment. I can't remember, does EMR now have a box for No. no. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Do you have the power? Put it in your comments I don't know. somewhere. I understand that, no. but that means that some RTs will do that and some RTs won't. Uh, so but cons have a box, consistency, yeah. It's consistent. If it says power set, yeah. then that way they can actually document they can see. So you, know, you can go back three days and see that my power's not moved and I've gone from 75 to 65 and I know in three days I'm doing good. But how do you know that now when you keep this at 75, you're looking your power's all over the place because how often do you do net checks? Q2? Q4. Q4. So your power is going to be different every time then, isn't it? Because you guys are chasing that number. Is that right? Maybe. Yeah. yeah, if it moves. Yeah. And it's so going to move eventually. Right, but if I but move yeah. my, yeah, you're right. So we've got to get away from that, I want to dump a P of 75. They've got to give you something there because it's not going to stay there. We typically adjust that according to the file, but initially. As you should. So, so, so like, I guess what I'm extracting from this is it would be great just as a trending yeah, and I'm not telling you to never touch it. Right. If I don't, again, if this number goes up acutely, you're going to see a damp and chest wiggle, right? You're going to, because I'm not ventilating as well. Think of volume ventilation, okay? What happens in volume ventilation when my compliance takes a dump? The pressure goes up. That's exactly what's happening here. Okay? You're going to see a dampened chest wiggle, so I'm not ventilating as much, and it's taking me more pressure. And it may be as a simple thing as draining your tubing or passing a catheter. If I have a SATA 88 and I have good chest wiggle, do I need to suction? No, right? Do I have a patent airway? Yeah. So suctioning again is very, very infrequent. The patient will tell me when he needs to be suctioned. I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit here. Thoughts, questions, comments? Should I ask about uh, suctioning or should we wait? We'll talk about suctioning. I'll bring that up. Okay? So, you guys got to be the messengers. And that's all the way down to babies, too, for any of you who work in a cube. Okay? 
doesn't change as acutely in NICU as it does in adults. But I literally have watched this number move within 20 minutes. I've seen it drop 15 centimeters on a kid with a, a, a chest tube, and apparently that chest tube wasn't bubbling or working right, and all of a sudden it just boom, and all of a sudden that went down. So it can happen. So how do I know I'm maxed out on my delta P? Well, I can only go to a power of 10, whatever number this gives me, it gives me, right? You guys ever heard that your delta P can't be three times your mean air pressure? You ever heard that? Okay kind of a fallacy out there. It can be. I can have a mean airway pressure of 10 and a delta P of 30, but I may not be managing my patient as well as I could. So in other words, if I do a change and do a blood gas, and then I make another change and do a blood gas because my CO2 hasn't moved, or if my CO2 hasn't moved within 20% of its original value, this isn't working. Stop going up on your delta P. Next thing I want to do is change the frequency. Okay, so frequency is the time it takes that piston to go that same distance. Conventional ventilation, right, we do a, um, when we decrease our, our rate on conventional, we're decreasing our minute ventilation. I decrease my rate on the oscillator, I'm increasing ventilation. So let me show you. Okay, all eyes on the lock. Tell me what you see. More time. More time? More volume. More volume. Volume. Right. That's the biggest culprit to my title line. You see bigger breaths. Piston's still going clavicle to mid-thigh, but it's taken a heck of a lot longer to get there, so I have more time to blow off CO2. Still going the same distance. Just getting a lot longer to get there. More yeah. time to <laughs> blow off. Oh, really, I kind of say it like that. Okay? So, big difference in tidal volume. So for adults, we usually start at five to six hertz, okay? Bigger patients, we start at five. Smaller patients, we start at six. Peds is more like a seven to nine. And then babies are higher, okay? And you can see that I have more time here. I've changed the slope of that waveform, but I'm still going the same distance, okay? So, a way to remember it, if I want my CO2 to go up, turn my hertz up. If I want my CO2 to go down, turn my hertz down. Okay? All right. Inspiratory time. 33% means that piston's moving forward 33% of the time and backwards 66% of the time. Kind of that IE of 1 to 2. Okay? In adults, if I move that up to 50%, now I'm only moving back half the time instead of two-thirds of the time. But I'm moving forward half the time. I'm going to recruit more lung. I'm going to ventilate better. Okay? Do you guys ever move your inspiratory time percent? No, but really, really, it's kind of people put on 30% of your touch. You can touch it. You're allowed no, to you touch, touch it. Kind of it. Uh, you can touch it. like last year. I, I wouldn't consider elastic checker. Um, I would probably do that before I do a cuff leak. Let's talk about a cuff leak, okay? There are places out there that every patient goes on a cuff leak before they go on, okay? If you read Dr. Deerdack, anything he says, he says everybody goes on a cuff leak. And we don't validate that, I'll tell you why. We usually say, if I can't keep my pH at least 7.2, I'll do a cuff leak. But if I have pH 7.2, I don't care if my CO2 is 90, I'm not going to do a cuff leak. So how do you guys do a coupling? I get a syringe, mm -hmm. and I take my syringe and I draw out enough air to my mean airway five pressure centimeters. drops five centimeters, and then how do I get it back up to 25? Increase the flow. Increase the flow, because the flow, it's thought that the more flow through the circuit will help flush out CO2 plus along um, the side of the cup. We're not gonna cause bath, anything like that. It's not that much of a leak, okay? All right, what if my patient has an air leak? You still gonna do the cuff that way? If I have three chest tubes in, I sure don't want to, um, I'm sorry, if I have eight ARDS, why would I want to go from 24 to 19 on an ARDS patient? You think he's gonna to tolerate that very well? Probably not, okay? So why don't I do it backwards? Why don't I 
increase my flow to 29, and then take the air out so that goes back to 25. To compensate. So know why you're going on. On a, on a new location, I'm probably going to take the air out first and then go up. In an ARDS patient, I'm probably going to go up because he'll tolerate that better and then take the air out. Okay? Does that make sense? So think about which way to do a coupling. Both ways work. Okay? So really it's just CPAP with the wiggle. CPAP's used to oxygenate, wiggle's used to ventilate. It's really not too hard of a concept. Okay? So when should we initiate? It's not a rescue device. It is a lung protective strategy device. Okay? Is this true picture? Wow. I used to think it was, but it's not. Um, we know it's not a rescue device, okay? We want to protect those lungs, all right? You guys know now when, you're, when your patients are sick, right? You use ARDSNET protocol. You can tell when your patient's sick. But let me add another um, a kit to your toolbox. Do you guys look at OIs? I bet you look at for, for nitric oxide, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay? Look at OIs to go on nitric. There's no reason you shouldn't be looking at OIs to go on the oscillator, okay? This formula is very easy. You can Google it. Most, unless you have an eye staff, most of your blood gas machines will give you an OI, okay? Oxygen index tells me how hard this ventilator has to work to oxygenate my patient. And I want to keep looking at OIs once I'm on to see if it's working. Biggest culprit here, small change in mean airway pressure will be a big change in, in your OI. Now, the reason why I really truly believe in OIs our blood gases are just a snapshot in time, right? When do we do a blood gas? What? We just suction, don't touch it. Oh, we just turn, don't touch. Oh, you know, right? Don't we wait for that perfect moment? Because we want those perfect numbers, right? <laughs> don't we? We all do it. If we do an OI, I do my first gas at 10 o'clock, because blood gases are just a snapshot in time. I do a blood gas at 10 o'clock, I'm on 100%, my PO2 is 40, I get a sick patient, right? I repeat that gas at 10.30, my PO2 is 38. Is my patient worse? Kind of hard to say, but I guarantee you that first gas, my OI might have been 16, second gas, OI is 24. Now is my patient worse? Yeah. Okay? Because something here changed, and usually it's mean airway pressure or your PO2 is lower, whatever, and your OI is going to go up. So, all the studies, OIs of 24, in adults, so think mean airway pressure in your AR um, ARSNET protocol. OIs of 24, you need to start thinking oscillator. Okay? Yeah, that little bit uh, with this OI, it's a little bit complicated because not every lock is sizing, not every uh, lock gas lock is sizing. There's a lot, a lot of these things when they're running blood. Uh, and it can affect on your judgment when you get in using this formula, plugging that stuff in and get that number and judgment wise, you stop it. Well, your mean airway pressure is, is not going to change and your pressure no, no, is not no, going to change. No, no, I'm talking about the PO2. PO2 that you're going to use specifically for uh, when you're using this oxygen index. Oxygen index. Okay. A little bit very dangerous. Dangerous? Not dangerous to judge when you start doing changes. Because you don't trust your results? Sometimes the result not besides. We see on the patients on the floor where we just regular patient when we're doing EPG and it's coming so different sometimes. Okay. Well, it's just another tool to use and, and hopefully, oh, sorry, you should have gotten a glass. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay. So OIs are another tool, okay? Um, I'm just going to kind of skip over this stuff because I want to get to other things. Okay, so when it should be initiated? Again, use your critical thinking skills. You know when your patient's getting sick, right? FiO2 is a 60, peaks a 10, you know your pressure is a 24. You need to start thinking oscillator and start looking at OIs. Maybe you have two OIs greater than 20, 24 within a half hour of each other, okay? Earlier intervention produces better outcomes in spite of those studies that we talked about. Did we talk about the studies earlier? Yes, we did. Okay, so initial setting, patient needs to be paralyzed and sedated. Once we go on and he transitions, we can get rid of the paralytics, okay? But you gotta keep them sedated. 
FiO2 usually 100. If you go in early, you could probably set that FiO2 about 10% above. Mean airway pressure, we usually set five above whatever they are on conventional. Okay. Power of four. What's my delta P going to be at a power of four? So we do function. No, nope, you have no idea because of compliance. I set three of you up on the outside or power of four, and I will get three different readouts here because of your lung disease. Remember, nothing correlates here. I have no idea what my what my delta P is going to be because of my compliance. Okay. So but we start with four. Huh? Start with four, whatever this is, it is. Okay, and then you're going to adjust five to ten centimeters for chest wiggle, shoulder to mid thigh. Right? My toes are going like this. I have way too much ventilation. I'm going to turn it down. If you barely see any chest wiggle, I'm going to turn it up. Right? Again, I don't care where this power is. I don't care if it's 4.0 or 8.8, .8, but I need to know where it is. Okay? Um, frequency, we're going to start at 5 to 6. And usually most adults, we're going to start at a flow of 30. Peds, we start at a flow of 20. Okay? So how do we know we have a mean airway pressure? We initially go on, okay? So first thing I'm going to do is sedate and paralyze my patient. Second thing I'm going to do is suction really, really well because I want to go 24 hours and beyond without suctioning. Suction causes de recruitment and air traffic. Third thing I want is a pH of at least 7.2. The more acidotic I am, the more I'm going to crash and burn some bowls and with whatever you, you do. Third, fourth thing I need is a blood pressure. Mean arterial pressure of at least 75. I know that's a little high, but I need something to get me going. You can turn it, you know, tolerate a lower mean arterial pressure once I'm on. But I need a higher, this already increases interthoracic pressure, pulmonary vascular resistance. I need a higher mean arterial pressure to start with. I'm not going to put a lot of high blood pressure. Okay? And then maybe we're going to do a lung recruitment maneuver. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? So, how do I know my lungs recruited when I first go on? How do I know I have the right mean airway pressure here? X-ray. Before x-ray, saturation, saturation of 88 and 88, 88, 88 and higher, right. Because I'm not getting a chest x-ray for a little while, and I need to, to make changes right now, okay? So, when we look at chest x-ray, we try to wait an hour. We don't count ribs like we do in babies. We're looking at, at diaphragms, the shape of the diaphragm. Are they flat? Are they domed? costophrenic angles, all that stuff we're looking at, okay? You should be able to wean your FiO2 in the first four hours. If you can't wean your FiO2, your lung is not recruited, or you've waited so long that I've already kind of got one foot in heaven's door and I'm not going to be able to, okay? All right? Just because we've done it that way doesn't mean we always do it that way, all right? Um, conversion back, again, we're going to try to get back down to minimal settings usually about a mean airway pressure of 24. Um, delta P to where we can um, do things with the patient, he stays saturated. And again, unlike babies, we have to go back to conventional because we have to let them wake up, okay? Always wean your FiO2 first, okay? Learn to think outside the box. Know that physicians, nursing, and RTs have to be trained, okay? It's a team effort. When we look at chest wiggle factor, we kind of look at this dope, okay? Not only do you want to look at chest wiggle factor, shoulder to mid-thigh, but you want to look at symmetry. Do you chart chest wiggle factor, clavicle to mid-thigh, right equals left? You don't want to be charting chest wiggle factor good. Okay, what's good? No idea what's good, right? And hopefully you guys are doing bedside report. Okay, you do report down in your office and you tell me Mr. Jones' chest wiggle is really good. I come up and I'm thinking, well, I don't think it's very good. Mm -hmm. Is it not very good because his compliance changed? Or is it not very good because your definition of good is different than my definition of good? I would encourage you to do bedside report and say, this is good chest wiggle, okay? Now I know what you mean by good, but I certainly wouldn't chart good. I would chart exactly what I see. CWF is a pretty universal term. Chest wiggle factor, I would chart shoulder to mid thigh or shoulder to groin, whatever you see. I would certainly do this periodically with the nurse. I don't know if they chart chest wiggle factor, but the last thing you want is you charting clavicle to mid thigh and her charting clavicle to groin at 9 o'clock. One of you has got to think about it, okay? Plus, how is the nurse going to know when to call you if you're not on the same page? Because remember, change in chest wiggles, change in, in compliance, okay? So, 
try to do a bedside assessment. It's okay to chart CWF, clavicle to mid-thigh, right, greater than left, if I'm laying on my left side and I have three chest tubes. But if I don't, you need to figure out why it's not symmetrical, okay? But you want to look at that. Obstruction, pneumos, is it your equipment, or water in the tubing, lots of things can affect chest wiggle, okay? Breast sounds, they're not breathing, so it's kind of hard to listen. You can listen to the intensity of the noise. The resonance gets louder or softer. But nurse wants to listen to the heart and the belly. Can she? Yes. Yeah. What do we do? If I stop the piston, what am I interrupting? Ventilation, right? Am I going to de-recruit the lung? No, because it's totally separate. I'm on seat one. Okay? So how long can you hold your breath? That's how long I'm going to let her listen. Okay, but again, I'm going to think a little bit. What if I have a pH of 6.98 or 7.17? Why would I want to interrupt ventilation? And no disrespect to her, but if all she's going to do is make a check mark to say, yeah, I did my, my assessment. Okay, I may ask her to defer that. And hopefully you guys cluster your care and we do it once a shift we're not, or once a day. We're not going to do it every two hours. Okay. Um, Bronx, you can Bronx, same way. Just make sure you stop the piston, let them go down. Again, how long can you hold your breath? Pull the, the Bronx out and start your piston again. And what about suction? Okay, we're going to talk about sure. suction. Okay? We already talked about blood pressure and um, uh, pH, so I'm going to kind of skip over this. Okay, watch for changes. You guys know that. Keep track of your PF ratios and your OIs. Um, try to wait an hour before we do um, a chest x-ray. You're going to do them um, periodically to assess lung volume. Um, don't stop the piston, okay? Don't let them roll the patient. Lost a patient out. Uh, x-ray didn't, they knew everything, they wouldn't listen. And he rolled her over, put the cassette in, rolled her back, she had chest tubes, COVID and died. The, as years of my experience with this, the best way to do it, especially if you have a patient 30 degree head of the bed, to get the x-ray, let them climb under this and get behind the bed. And then you guys gently lean forward, you can slide the, the cassette right there and take the picture, okay? Leave the piston on, all right? Oximetry, you guys know, um, the more saturated I am, the more, the more I have a recruited lung. Um, do you guys use transcutaneous CO2? Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to. There's a lot of good products out there now. The biggest reason, even though it's for trending, what are all my alarms? Mean airway pressure. Do I have any alarms for ventilation? No. Nope. At least it would give me a trend if that um, uh, delta P went up. Okay. Um, remember, ABGs don't hold the same. Thing. Um, I already kind of gave the skill this morning of that I need to talk fast because I only have an hour. It's a lot of information. Um, there's even more information on the A that I really want to touch. And I'm, I'm going to go over the setup and I'll tell you why. Have you guys all set up? Um, set up the A and a baby. Okay, so I'm going to pick on you guys. And we have a 26 weeker with RDS, and I want a mean airway pressure of 12. Where would you set the flow? Um, what was it again? RDS, uh, 26 weeker. 26 weaker. Um, Where would you set the flow? Where would you set the flow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or anybody, tell me where you would set the flow. 20. I like to say 20. Yeah, that's right. I, I see what I'm saying? 12, so so. My, my point is, I've asked three different people, the same baby, <laughs> and I got three different answers, right? Not that any of them are wrong. I think 15 might be a little high, and I'll tell you why um, when we get through this. So I'm going to show you, and I know you've done this forever, but I'm going to show you a new way, not a new way, a, a way that I learned in San Diego how to set it up. I don't know how to set it up any other way. I don't know why everybody didn't learn that way, because I go all over the United States and nobody ever heard of 10-2 set. I know you did because we taught you that. But, and why we learned it that way and nobody else did it. And I'm not saying you're wrong the other way, but we're going to get to a point where everybody sets it up the same way. And so we have enough flow, um, and we'll talk about that more, okay? So again, I'm going to speak quickly so we can get through some of this stuff. Those of you, I know you weren't here this morning, but a lot of the stuff I'm going to skip over because this is normally a two-hour lecture. And I don't have enough time to, to, to tell you all. So um, we're not going to go into theory. Um, we are going to say why we use the oscillator, though. We know that mechanical ventilation 
conventional ventilation, again, takes the path of least resistance. It doesn't know where the sick lung is, does it? So that gas is going to go to that healthy lung, overventilate that health, healthy alveolar light, and never get to that atelectatic region. So we kind of have this vicious circle. The more cycling we do, the more shearing of that lung tissue, the more problems we have. And somewhere between all this, we have a mean airway pressure. Where the oscillator has a constant mean airway pressure that prevents that over distension or under distension. Make no mistake, under ventilating a lung can cause lung injury. Also, do you guys go to deliveries? Do you use Neopuff or, or Vax? It depends on the delivery. Okay, so full inflating Vax? Okay, so if you're really not paying attention to what you're doing because you're dealing with mom or the nurse or something like that, um, the first seven breaths, if you're not care careful, you can cause lung injury. So that's how careful we have to be when we're, we're ventilating these kits, okay? So this just shows you constant mean airway pressure with the oscillator. The waveform there, even though this ventilator looks old and archaic, it does produce a waveform, and that's the piston going back and forth that waveform. This, again, is your pressure waveform. Anything above or below that mean airway pressure is going to cause lung injury. It's not so much the atelectasis that causes lung injury. It's how we treat that atelectasis. So very small tidal volumes, usually uh, equal to or less than anatomical dead space, just like I said this morning. Uh, it all stemmed from a doc 100 years ago sitting on his back porch watching dogs pant trying to figure out how they could ventilate and hypothesized and then proved that yes indeed you can exchange gas at less than dead space ventilation. Very, very fast rates. Hertz rates are expressed in the hertz. One hertz is 60 cycles. So if we're on a hertz or frequency of 15, 15 times 60 is 900. Okay. This is a long on pressure control ventilation. It's a pressure control of 34 and a mean of 25. I want you to watch an alveolus and watch how they open. Um, because they're overextended and on exhalation how they disappear because they're collapsing. Pressure on the outside is greater than the pressure on the inside, so they're not recruited, okay? We're going to do this all day long until we get that lung recruited, okay? So we don't do a, a, um, APRV in babies, but we can do high frequency. So that same mean airway pressure of 25, now that it's constant, shows you a much more uniform ventilatory pattern. We don't have that overinflation or underinflation, mm -hmm. deflation, whatever you want to call it, okay? Full of rat lung. And again, this just shows you, again, much more uniform ventilatory pattern um, on a lung biopsy, okay? So not really going to get into this too much because it takes a lot of time. Um, I just want you to know if you really want to understand how this works differently than conventional ventilation, Google Dr. Chang, C-H-A-N-G. He's got a nice 13-page article. It's really deep, but you can read it. Um, conventional ventilation works by convective ventilation and molecular diffusion. Oscillator adds a few more things. This pendulift effect I'm going to end up demonstrating to you when I recruit this one. Okay? So what happens is we turn this flow meter on, and the flow goes out the back of the ventilator through this tubing, picks up humidity, comes back up through here, we have an inspiratory side, we have an expiratory side, and we have gas escaping here, okay? I know there are people, what we like to do, how come I'm not pressurized? There we go. People like to play, okay, make noises, don't do that because you're going to pop that back. Okay, do not occlude this. Don't put a cloth over it. Don't put a cup over it. If you see nursing do it, explain to them if that's occluded, where do you think all that pressure is going to go? It's going to stay here. What you're feeling is the excess bias flow that's not being used. Okay, so we don't want to occlude that. The rest of the gas goes down through here. You guys know when you empty this with a syringe or a glove or a uh, cup, whatever you want to use, you know, not to empty it all the way, leave a little bit of water in there, because if you empty it all the way, we go to ambient air, and we lose our pressure. Don't leave yourself behind that, okay? The higher we turn our bias flow, the more mean airway pressure I get. I turn my flow down, the less mean airway pressure I get. Mean airway pressure is dependent on my bias flow. The more flow through the circuit and the adjustment here causes that mushroom valve to inflate, and the more resistance I get, the more mean air pressure. Okay? 
I really want enough flow to where my mean air rate pressure is somewhere between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Okay? If I'm maxed out here, I don't have enough flow going here. If I minimize it, hopefully it means I'm getting extubated. Okay? All right. Should all be reviewed, right? So pressure volume weight curves, you guys all know that we only have a very small safe window. We're in that zone of de-recruitment. When we look at babies, we count ribs. We want their diaphragms at eight to nine ribs. So you can see here, I'm way above eight ribs. Um, so I'm in this area of de-recruitment. I'm gonna turn this mean air rate pressure up one to two centimeters at a time. And like adults or kids, we go two to five. Okay, so very small amounts. If I'm in the area of over distension, I'm way over ventilated or over uh, distended here, I'm going to turn this mean air rate pressure down one to two centimeters at a time. I really want to be in this nice little sweet spot to where I'm at eight ribs. Okay? So very small movements in babies. I'm not going to go over all this stuff you guys know. Max out, the B max is out at 55, this max is out at 45. What I do want to talk about, though, is um, it's active exhalation. It's a push-pull, okay? And we do make sure that when you have your blender hooked up, that you have your compressed air teed in. I don't know if you ever noticed that we kind of go through the motions, but that uh, compressed air uh, has two functions. One is to blend my FiO2. The other is to cool that piston down, okay? We talked to the adults this morning about cooling the room down. We can't really do that with babies. Um, but babies' rooms aren't usually too hot. Uh, I've never seen one of these overheat in neonates because we're much more used to it. We, we're more familiar with it. We don't use it as a rescue so much in neonates as we do adults and max out the settings. Do you guys intervene early with this in babies in your NICU? Or is it a last resort? Well, that's early. Pardon me? That's an early. Good, good. In, in your neonates. In, in your NICU. Good, good. That's good to hear. So this slide, I just want to show you the piston. Again, um, overheating that piston is what's sitting behind this bellows, and it's got a lot of moving parts. So that's why we don't want to overwork it and make sure uh, that it stays cool. Okay, so let's talk about alarms. Just like the B this morning, this is going to be a review for those of you who are already here. We have four alarms. They all sound the same. They all have to do with the, what we call the dump valve here, okay? So, four things here. The first one says mean airway pressure greater than 50 centimeters of water pressure. Hmm. That's a leak somewhere. Dang it. Is this an old circuit? No. Okay, you got to pop off. Well, we'll do it this way. Well, I'm hoping can't do it. What happens when it gets an excess of um, 50 centimeters of water pressure, it dumps all that pressure to this dump valve and it stops the piston, okay? And you're gonna get a high pressure alarm, all right? So what would cause all that pressure buildup in the oscillator? Secretions. Secretions, what else? Water. Water. Tube. For the King most, tube. right, kinked tube for the most part. It's, some things occluded, tension, pneumo, things like that, okay? And you're not gonna fix it until you fix the problem. These ever notice these little lines here? They're here for a reason, it tells you exactly what to do. It's telling me my piston's still on, but I need at least five to seven centimeters of water pressure to work. So it's telling you, you need to reset me, okay? And remember, hitting it doesn't work. I have to hold it. I always say take a cleansing breath, one 1,000, two 1,000, or just hold it till that piston's on. If the piston was still on, it just needed pressure to work. So you don't need to be doing one of these, okay? All right. Okay, second alarm is mean airway pressure less than 20% of set max mean airway pressure. That's what that gentleman was asking me this morning about that going off. Technically, what is this? It's a low pressure alarm, right? So what happens is 
what will cause a low pressure line. Leak, disconnect, okay? Again, piston's still on, it just doesn't have any pressure to work. So again, it's telling you, you need to restart me after you fix the problem. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, and off we go. Now, have you ever fixed the problem and hit reset and it doesn't work? Piston won't go on? No, never? Usually when you're at low um, mean airway pressures, what's happening is this alarm is, or this alarm is 20% of the low pressure, and you can hit it all day long until the cows come home, it's not going to work. So you kind of have to lower the alarm, reset it, reset it to start your piston, and then change your alarm back again. And that's the only reason it's not going, because it's seeing less than 20% of this set max level. Okay? The two middle ones have to do with our mean airway pressure. Remember this fluctuates, and it fluctuates because we want baby to breathe. We don't want it to fluctuate more than a centimeter, so that may go to 14, it may go to 16, okay? Where do you set your thumbnails here in babies? Two, five? Hopefully not more than five. So, who works with you? You all do? Tell me what you said of that. So around three centimeters above and three. Pardon me? Three. three. Okay, three above and three below. Yeah. So this is going to be at 18, and this is going to be at 12. Okay? I know, I'm just so bad at math. So what would make these two alarms, you see the lines here? They don't tell you to reset it, because if they go off, it's not necessarily going to stop your system. Okay? What would make these alarms go off? In other words, what would make your mean air pressure grow greater than 18 or less than 12? Both and or. So are those alarms just to let you know it went off and corrected itself? Right. Well, it didn't correct itself because it'll still alarm it, but, but it's not going to stop your piston. It's letting you know you're outside of your alarms. Oh, you're right. So it doesn't stop the piston, but it's going to alarm. Right. So what would make that happen? What kind of conditions would make that happen? A patient is over breathing? Maybe, not necessarily. Over breathing? Over breathing, right. Baby's awake and he's over breathing. Really starting to breathe. So, how do you fix that? Sedation. We don't want to knock the baby out. We want him to contribute, but we don't want him to. Unlike adults, we can't let them breathe because this flow won't support their breathing. But it certainly will in babies. So, we just want to give them just a little bit to knock the edge off. What else would make that go? way back and forth. Water in the tubing. Okay? Or maybe a leak in here, right? Leak. So it'll still continue to ventilate, but it's going to let you know I'm, I'm outside the range here. I'm going above and below that mean area pressure. It's telling me I don't have very stable mean area pressure, do I? So I want to fix that. Okay? Alarm silence is 45 seconds. Only ventilator will you work with that if I touch it again, it does not cancel. So I am stuck with a 45 second alarm. Okay, don't turn your back to the ventilator. I get an alarm, I'm not going to hear it. The only alarm I'm going to know about is a disconnect. Because sometimes the silencing of that piston is louder than the alarm itself. Okay, so make sure nurses know that if they um, hit your alarm silence for whatever reason. Because, you know, we all know it doesn't fix the, the problem, it just gets rid of the noise, okay? Other things that can cause these low pressure are your mushroom valves. I see you guys are way ahead of the game, your cap diaphragms, you keep an emergency pack here. I think they're as important as your bag mask, okay? If one of these go bad, where do you have to go to get new equipment? Down the hall, out of the room, is too far. When you guys do your vent checks, do you check your rear lines here? out this morning, huh? Um, I would encourage you gently to, to check these. If these spin, it means that this cap diaphragm has popped out and it's just kind of sitting there. And you won't notice it as much on babies as you do on adults, because adults are paralyzed, babies are not. So you may see just a little bit and not realize that it's, it's happening. So make sure you check it. So first takeaway message is we never, never, never disconnect. And then I kind of have to retract that, that statement and say the only time we disconnect is if we have to troubleshoot the ventilator. Okay? So what you'll have to do is take this out, and depending how stable your kid is, you can try to put tab A into slot B. Sometimes it doesn't happen very often, so I just toss it on the floor and get a new one. Okay? You will be excited to know that in the next couple of months, 
These are coming, they're getting remanufactured, and they're going to be all one piece. You don't have to worry about it anymore. The last thing that can happen is you get a pinhole in one of these. I haven't seen that happen in a long time. Um, but which one has the pinhole? No idea, so you'd have to change all three of them. Okay? Questions about alarms? The other thing down here is just telling you source gas, I have less than 50 psi. This battery low. There's a 12 volt battery in the back of this ventilator. Okay, it does not run the ventilator. All it does is run the audio and the visual um, for your um, ventilator. But you guys have put your bracket right behind there, so you're not going to be able to change the battery very quickly. You should get rid of this bracket, okay? But you just unscrew it and it flips down, and that's a little 9 volt battery. And all the years I've been working with the oscillator, I've never had to change the battery. These guys are maintenance every six months and buy them and change of that battery. However, you can change out the battery on the patient. Just take it out, it won't go blank. There's a fuse inside here that will keep it lit until you change the battery, okay? How do you test your battery? Okay, you test it every time you set this up. Did you know that? Every time I hit my reset, watch what happens. Light goes on, so I know my battery's good, okay? Oscillator overheated, this gets to 150 degrees. The slide's gonna go on, it's to 170 degrees, it will shut down, nothing you can do about it. And then oscillator stopped is, a, is an audio and visual. These are just visuals. If that ever happens, does that go to kind of burn here or just cool down? Just please cool down. Some people, when they see that light go on, they'll start getting oscillating fans, and just put a fan on each side here of the column, that may help. You know, but in the adult world, remember we talked about getting that room cooled down, and the baby's probably not an option. Uh, so, how many years have you been working with the oscillator? I was going to ask you last time. Um, it came out in '91, and I started working with it about that. '89. Have you ever seen a hole in the diaphragm? Yes. Is it back here? Uh huh. That happened to us just a couple of months ago. Using it was it in in on the patient a long time? There was. I don't know how long, but I got called from another therapist, like emergency come down, troubleshoot, just put some more eyes on it. And it would be, and it, it just made a funny sound. Yeah. It was really weird. It sounds floppy. It did, and it just dropped the pressure by a lot. So mm -hmm. then the bag, I looked at everything. Um, I changed out the circuit and it repressurized and everything, I, but I couldn't find a real... It may not have been a very good seal. Sometimes they would <laughs> buy it if it was an old, um, Water bellows trap and sitting there, the rubber might have gotten. I mean, I don't that was know. the only thing I could have concluded because it was a funny sound. Yeah, you, it's pretty distinct. It is, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I can't find a real tear, but I, but I said it, it, it happened. Maybe, not. maybe yeah. just a sloppy fit. Yeah, I heard it more on adults. I heard it was on adults. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, I don't hear it too much on babies. Yeah. But, and usually because they're maxed out on their settings, and that just when it's working. Um, other thing back in the day, these used to be black knobs. You ever notice now they're blue and green? The blue knob adjusts the blue mushroom valve, and the green knob adjusts the green line. Did you guys know that? Kind of a neat thing. The reason why things aren't very different with this, um, it's cost a lot, a lot of money because this is a class three device. To change those knobs from black to color takes an act of Congress. They're going through FDA, very, very expensive. That's why it still looks the way it does. 